In this video, I will discuss how to reduce the volume of project documentation in any project. Please click below to subscribe for future videos. So firstly, the problem is that people typically write too much. Uh, here's an example of a aspect of the problem. This is a project summary. And you can see this particular person has been going on for quite a while to describe their project. And so our face value, it looks kind of impressive. They read all these words, but if you actually read it in more detail, you find they only said a few things. So this is a little kind of verbose. And if you see a lot of paragraphs like this, it tends to kind of be very off-putting and bit by bit, you're not even sure which bit to kind of believe or even to kind of look at. It takes a lot of labor to do that. Here's a similar example of an ambiguous requirement down here. Um, if you can imagine there will be a backlog or a spec of maybe 20, 30 or 40, 50 of these, you can imagine that it can become very tedious after a while to really kind of read the requirement and make sense out of it. And even kind of trust is it actually telling you uh, the correct stuff. So for example, uh, the system should allow data entry of data items relevant for customer payment or allows a user ID to be entered as a charge the amount to. If an ID is used and there are insufficient for customer account funds, then either request a credit card increase or notify the account is overdrawn and flag the account as overdrawn, email receipt of the transaction. Now, there are some ambiguities in there we have to kind of work out. And if the paragraph becomes any more complicated than this, uh, it'd be very difficult to figure out exactly what to do next. A similar example would be constraints. Again, uh, all teams have constraints. Uh, but this one here is kind of very fluffy. Uh, constraints are a natural part of any project. Thank you for saying that. Uh, constraints have all well been documented over history and can be viewed by Googling the word product constraints scheme. So we've spent maybe two or three uh, sentences here actually just giving nothing about the constraints of the project. Again, so this becomes very wordy. So these examples here of a plan, a requirement and a constraint are just examples of being way too verbose. Uh, they take time to kind of write. They typically are ignored by the recipient. And because they're so ambiguous and so wordy, uh, they can be error prone. So this is certainly a way it could be done, but uh, by no means a good way to kind of do uh, project documentation. So why do we have documentation? Uh, primarily to find mistakes early. If we have a backlog written down, architecture, interfaces, uh, designs, etc., we can find mistakes early on in our thinking and our approach. And they are quicker to kind of find and repair there than they would be to go build the system and then find them kind of later on. Now we can't find all errors at the beginning. Uh, sometimes we have to go build something and to even to learn about what we're building, but we reserve those areas for a few and mostly uh, to try to kind of write things down beforehand and kind of find things very quickly early on. Remember key points. So we are working with a team of people, customers, management team, etc., suppliers. And therefore, to remember what we said, we just kind of go on verbal communication. Verbal is good for quickly uh, communicating a concept uh, to kind of get some clar clarification on it or clarity, but then we have to kind of write it down. Otherwise, we just have to say it again, uh, time and time again. So it really kind of helps us kind of avoid avoid the uh, verbal rehashing of text every time we kind of meet somebody or change your mind or they change their mind. And that becomes very expensive. And then visibility. Uh, the idea here is that if you write things down, you can see them and critique them. It could be a schedule, a plan, a set of requirements, a workflow, like a user flow. If you kind of write it down, you can see things more clearly and figure out ways to optimize. And therefore, the recipient or customer can see it more clearly. Management team can too, and your team can. So uh, the writing of things down helps you clarify things uh, visually before you're going to get stuck with a bunch of bad code uh, later on. So let's discuss solutions and four examples of those solutions. And we're going to apply them to the previous problem paragraphs we had in the earlier slide. And the first one is a table. Uh, the idea here is we move from a paragraph to a table format, and therefore we can see things more clearly. Uh, we actually take the text and break it up into table format so we can find things, label them, 
and kind of sort them and then pick them apart much easier we, than we can a major paragraph uh, that we had beforehand. Second one is then to use single sentences. So we'll take our text of our paragraphs and we'll, we'll just have one sentence per line here. And if there were more than one sentence before in our paragraph, we then add the new line to our table. If we had more than one sentence per paragraph, they become ambiguous. Okay, if we have one here and another sentence here, they become ambiguous, uh, particularly if they are separated by ands or ors or you know, they kind of follow on ideas. Uh, it's difficult to know exactly how they combine. So we're going to have one sentence per table item here to make things more clear. Uh, next one is the label them. And so the labels allow us to kind of access them quickly and refer to them uh, versus saying, well, it's the 15th requirement in the fourth paragraph at the very end. Okay. Uh, that is difficult to kind of find. If we now have our requirements or a design or our test plans or whatever in a table format, uh, we can label them very quickly and refer back to them. Now we can say edit 15 or edit 2 or uh, go work on item list 6. And if there's a unique label for that thing, then we can find it very quickly. Now I'm using a Word document style here and a manual numbering, uh, but you could use a confluence page and numbering or you could use Jira entries uh, like a Jira issue type and the unique uh, Jira ID. There are many ways to kind of put a list together in a tool and then have the list being labeled automatically so we can find things and refer to things quickly in the list. Uh, decision tables. Uh, sometimes there are things in our requirements and our design uh, that are really decisions uh, where there could be tr uh, things that are going to either do this or do this given a particular condition. Uh, they can become difficult to kind of write down in a paragraph format or even a sentence format. And we'll discuss how to go from a table format to a uh, decision table format uh, like this one here. And then lastly, the decision diagrams. Uh, these tables are very good to kind of flesh out options and figure out what is really going on. But sometimes people like to kind of see them graphically and therefore we use the uh, decision diagram to kind of lay out some of the tables to kind of show the flow of events between kind of left and right. It gives kind of more like a timeline to it than the table, which is more conceptual, uh, the one above. So let's take our first example of a project scope. I'm going to use the concepts of tables, single sentences and labels uh, to kind of take this paragraph and make it a bit more understandable and even kind of find some of the mis mistakes in it uh, later on too. So we're going to take this here and convert it into a table format. Again, if we read it in carefully and then eliminate the kind of fluff, we end up with eight key concepts for our scope. Now I think you'll find that this table down here is much easier to read and navigate and understand and even kind of find things that are missing than trying to navigate our, ta our paragraph up here and even kind of figure out kind of what it meant. As we read it, our brain's going to try to, to, to decipher it. So to avoid that step or make that step unnecessary, I'm uh, just going to write down the paragraph in a table format at the very beginning and then going to save a, a whole translation activity uh, later on. So let's take our second example here of constraints. We're going to use the table format, the single sentences and labels uh, to take this paragraph here and make some sense out of it. In that case, we ended up with five constraints. If you read the paragraph, there's a lot of fluff in here. Actually, the first constraint actually comes out uh, down here. And so it took them all this time to figure out the first constraint, where the word support starts. And then the first few paragraphs there, the first few sentences there are completely fluff. So to say constraints are a natural part of any project and constraints have all been, have been well documented for over history, and can be viewed by Googling the word constraints. And typical constraints are scope, cost, and time. And then saying this project is no different and has constraints. That is a complete waste of time. And so what happened there is that the person writing the paragraph tied their self-worth to how many words they were writing. So our next example are the product requirements. These are worthy of getting right really at the beginning because you're going to have people code and test these things later on. We're going to use the same example here, uh, tables, single sentences and uh, labels. If you read the requirement here, it is very ambiguous. Uh, the system should allow data entry 
uh, for relevant items of customer payment or allow a user ID to be entered uh, to charge the amount to. There's two items there. If an ID is used uh, and there are insufficient funds, uh, then either request a credit increase or notify the account is overdrawn and then flag the account as overdrawn. So we have to kind of make sure we get our ands and ors combined correctly for that one and then email a receipt at the end. And again, it's not obvious right now if that's a unique thing we do all the time or tied to a particular pre-condition beforehand. So again, paragraphs become very ambiguous and it takes the developer to then guess or clarify or email, question it, and then we kind of hope they're going to get it right. So let's discuss some ways to fix that. Firstly, our table idea, uh, single sentence and labeling. Now we've figured out there are six requirements uh, by looking at the, uh, the paragraph, and we can figure out which ones are if, then, and which ones are just going to do them regardless. So the first two are the user going to does, and we have uh, three if conditions we uh, make in parallel, and then a final activity that occurs regardless. And just by doing the table alone, you can quickly figure out you know, which ones combine together and are there other are situations going on in the text. So the requirements are better handled by the table. And the table does a good job at listing out the requirements that we have, but it doesn't uncover the requirements we don't have yet. There could be all kinds of situations or other if conditions that occur above and beyond the three we've been given. So we have these conditions here for if, then, but there could be other ones too. Unless we know the system inside out or we can see it, uh, the table doesn't really help us reveal what is missing. So the truth table down here helps us kind of do that. So now we have these four conditions. Uh, credit card is being used by the user. ID with funds that are logged into with an account that has money. ID without funds and then accepts a credit increase on their account. And then we can put a, a truth symbol here for when that condition occurs. So requirement number one, <coughs> we have a credit card is used and therefore we have the payment accepted and email receipt. Uh, condition number two or requirement number two, now we have ID with funds, so they're logging with an ID, that's true. And we have the same outcome, uh, payment accepted and email receipt. Okay. Then it gets a bit more sticky. We have ID without funds, so we have a truth down here. And then they accept a credit increase, true. And uh, so therefore we accept the payment and we give them the receipt. And then if the, they don't accept their credit increase, now we have a false over here and a true for without funds, then we have to figure out what happens. Now we can see that the only time we do the credit card increase or the credit increase is this last condition. Now, the fact that we're putting this into a table format, you may come up with other combinations where things are true or false. And therefore, you may decide to add your own other table uh, to the end of it here uh, with other conditions that actually occur. Now, I've known people in the medical device and the uh, financial world <coughs> have these very ambiguous requirements in the kind of blue paragraph text, not realizing that the paragraph only covers half of the conditions that they really care about. And so the table kind of helps a little bit on that and clarify kind of where they are. But if you're really dealing with a, a critical system where you can't afford to have the code fail because something happened and you didn't kind of think about it beforehand, you really want to use the truth table to kind of flesh out those options and kind of see where there could be other situations occurring uh, that your initial paragraph or table uh, did not cover. Now, the truth table is a really way, a good way to clarify combinations of requirements and figure out if you're missing something and you need to kind of bulletproof the code better because uh, of other situations that could occur. When you've done that, you might find the decision diagram is a good way to kind of see that kind of flowing left to right in terms of time. So now we take our conditions out of our table. Uh, there's actually four in ours. We have three uh, diamonds here. We have ID with funds and ID without funds. So this is going to yes and no, which covers two of the options there. And then we can clearly say what happens if there's a yes and what happens if there's going to have a no. And then figure out uh, these outputs uh, over here and when they actually occur. So what else can we do with this particular style here? 
Uh, I've been discussing this kind of style of the tables, single sentences, and the diagrams. Uh, we can apply that to everything. Now, if you take a project plan, uh, typically we have scope, out of scope, customers, and these items here. They can all be uh, written as table format in a document or a wiki page or a, a conference page. So whereas you may have had long paragraphs before of text uh, that are difficult to navigate unless you are very familiar with the text, uh, they can all be replaced by tables. Now, if your organization tells you they like their long paragraphs and they don't like to have these tables here, then you're really going to have to ask the question kind of why, uh, without getting fired, of course. Um, maybe they like the ambiguity of their big plans, so nobody knows what's really going on. And nobody kind of looks bad by having a mistake because it's just buried in a bunch of text. Maybe they are emotionally attached to the volume of text, where they've learned that they can be uh, look as if they have more value or they added more value to the project by having longer documents. Okay. Unless you want to become a novelist and a writer, which you probably don't, you're on the wrong YouTube channel for that, you probably want to not do the long paragraphs and consider the, uh, the table format. Now, if you do get pushback on the table format, we are then into therapy. And yes, I do offer therapy sessions. Uh, put your therapy question down below, and I'll be happy to kind of give you some therapy on why do we not do tables and why do we want to do long paragraphs. Okay. You'll probably find it will be a historical habit issue uh, versus a practical kind of why don't we change the tables. I've yet to kind of find a technical team of any kind, hardware, software, IT, uh, that can't adapt their stuff better to a more concise table kind of format. Okay. And then we have requirements. We have uh, these type of requirements here. These are requirements types. Uh, they can all be put into a backlog in a particular tool like Jira or Rally or Confluence. Again, they become tables or entries into the tool. Uh, again, single sentences that are labeled. Even design documents. Uh, they don't have to be long narrative documents. They can be uh, tables of different types of information like architecture diagrams, interface lists, uh, data formats, and um, uh, the way we're going to process data. And even test plans. We can have tables for environments to be needed, uh, what to test, the list, how to test, maybe a column in the list, and the likely results. So again, they lend themselves particularly to uh, the, the kind of table kind of format. So in summary, teams don't need to write volumes of documentation to capture essential information. Some simple formats can really help. Thanks for watching this video. For more help on these or similar topics, please post a question below or see the links below.